Welcome to My Forever Home, the podcast. I'm Frances Cosway and I've helped hundreds of people create forever homes. I can't wait to share the journey with you. So let's start. Welcome to this episode of My Forever Home, the podcast, the sustainable homes and living season. And today I'm going to be talking with Anna Cumming from Sanctuary Magazine about big sustainable impacts you can make to your home, whether you're creating a new home or renovating. Now, I've been an avid reader of Sanctuary Magazine for many years now, and I always get inspired by the homes that people are building and get showcased in the magazine. They are nothing short of stunning, but also incredibly sustainable. There's also sustainable measures that are featured in the magazine and ways that you can make really big impacts. So it's also always a great resource and I'm a big reader. So when Anna, the editor of Sanctuary Magazine, said yes to coming on the podcast, I was excited about what was in store for me and also for you with her wealth of knowledge about what's happening with Australian homes. This is going to be a fabulous episode as Anna is going to share some of the most important ways you can make impact and make a difference to how you build and renovate your home and also touching on some of the really big things that are happening in Australia right now. But first, a little about Anna. So Anna Cumming is a writer, editor and communications professional with a long-standing interest in the built environment, in particular, the design of sustainable, energy efficient and comfortable homes that tread lightly on the earth. She has held a variety of communications roles at national not-for-profit Renew since 2010 and in 2019 took over as managing editor of Sanctuary Modern Green Homes, Australia's premier magazine dedicated to sustainable home design. She loves being part of the mission to inspire and educate people about design strategies, materials and systems available to achieve truly sustainable and delightful home. So with no further ado, welcome Anna to the show. Thank you very much, Francis. It's great to be here. I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, me too, because there's a lot of passion going on with this topic and just to be able to talk about homes in general and particular about what's happening in Australia from a sustainability perspective. And uh, for the listeners, Anna and I were talking a little bit offline about just what has happened so much in a short amount of time and the momentum that sustainability is having our homes in Australia is is getting traction. And uh, we're both really excited by that. So uh, he's two very passionate women uh, with you today. <laughs> yeah, so really just. Yeah, exactly. So I think just to be able to chat today about the changes we're seeing in Australia um, as people get, I mean, you just mentioned offline about the change in uh, people's impetus for this since the election, which is awesome. I'll just touch on in a previous episode, um, my partner Neil and I talked about how hard it was for us to build our sustainable home eight years ago. We just couldn't source the products or the knowledge we needed to create what we wanted at the time. It was just so hard. But things have really changed, though, in in the eight short years that we've seen. And I'm excited today to talk to you about what has changed and what people can do now that will have a big impact. And I think one of the most important and exciting changes has been to the regulation this year to the increase in the NADA star rating for new homes from six to seven stars. It was Oh, so excited when that happened. Eight years ago, we actually built our home to 7.2 stars, which was, well, it was almost groundbreaking eight years ago because everyone would just wanted to do, it had only just increased to six stars from five at the time. But we wanted to do that. And that was pretty rare back then that people actually wanted to go above and beyond what was the minimum. But I think, uh, I still think people um, are sometimes only wanting to build to the bare minimum. So having that minimum increase as mandatory is such good news. So I suppose my first question to you would be, what does the increase from six to seven stars mean in terms of energy efficiency? Yeah, look, the, the, the increase in the in the minimum standard, for it only applies to new homes um, yeah. and it's been a long time coming. It's uh, it's something that my that Sanctuary's publisher Renew, my employer, has been campaigning for for a long time, along with a coalition of over a hundred other organisations. We've been pushing for for this. Our advocacy team has been pushing for it, so we're delighted as well with the change. Um, uh, what it means in terms of energy efficiency, I asked my colleagues to to give me some numbers for this. Um, depending, awesome. it depends where you are in the country. Um, of course. But, 
increasing your Natter's energy efficiency rating from a minimum, the old minimum of six to the new minimum of seven stars will mean a decrease in your energy needed to heat and cool your home between 18 and 28%. And in most locations... Oh, that is huge. Yeah, in most locations, it's 20 to 25%. Um, so that is automatically a reduction in your energy bills to run your house, uh, not to mention emissions, <laughs> yeah. which go yeah. hand in hand. Um, so, I mean, this is something we've known for a long time, but as you say... And of course, it's been possible for people to build to higher than the than the mandatory minimum, um, and pe some people have chosen to do that, like you and Neil, mm. uh, and many people haven't. And so, increasing the mandatory minimum to seven stars will mean that everyone will have to. <laughs> and of course, you can still aim higher than that. A absolutely, and I mean, it's music to my ears when we have clients that come to us that either say we're building passive house or we want to go as high as we can on the star rating rather than we're just going to do what we are being told we have to do. So just the fact that it is now mandatory is just going to make such a big difference. Yeah, it, it will be mandatory. It's um, it's going to, there's a great period. It's going to be coming mm. in, in um, well, again, it's a little bit more complicated than just being able to say because it depends on the states. <laughs> yes. But generally speaking, it'll become mandatory um, in October 2023. Mm. And uh, there's no reason why people can't get on the bandwagon now yeah With absolutely already, yeah yeah and no, look I am finding that people if I think about you know the the 10 to 12 years that I've been running the studio uh, one of the key questions we ask our clients is what sustainable measures do you want to introduce i.e we want to do sort of the basics or we really want to go as far as we can and when people tick the box we want to go as far as we can it's becoming more and more common which is great yeah. It's that going beyond, oh, we're just going to do double glazing. But look, for new builds, um, you know, I I still have and I still know of people that, well, I'm just going to double glaze some of the windows because that will get me to the rating that I need. And then it's yeah. like, well, it's completely pointless to double glaze some windows and not others, really, unless you're going to heavily not zone. ideal. <laughs> it's not ideal. So um, what extra because th these will be the questions that people want to know. What extra yeah. will people need to do to go from six to seven in a from a practicality perspective? So I love that stat you've given us that we're going to, let's say, round it up to 25% energy saving. That is money in the bank for Absolutely. people. And Absolutely. And that talks. As soon as people can see a monetary benefit, it talks. Um, yep. Of course, we're interested in emissions as well, but it's often money that's going to make the difference. So to meet six stars, often it was you needed to double glaze a certain proportion of the home. Are you aware of what is going to need to be done to go from that six to seven as examples? Because it's obviously going to depend on so many different things. Yeah, look, the um, the, the Natus energy rating and and its equivalents, that's not the only way to, to meet the, the new requirements of the National Construction Code, but it is um, sort of the most, the, the main one. There are other pathways, but let's just talk about Natter's energy ratings for now. Yeah, Star this ratings. could be a whole episode, actually. Yeah, about exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a rabbit hole that we won't go down. It will, um, yes. The, um, it's not, it, it doesn't mandate specific features like double glazing or solar no, or anything. Um, the idea is that is that it's a measure of overall performance and um, what you're actually aiming for is a, a certain maximum energy use to heat and cool the home. Mm. And there are many ways to achieve that, lots of different strategies. Um, so the code sets a minimum performance level and then builders and designers, designers mostly, can choose which strategy to pursue to achieve those energy efficiency levels. And as you'd know, there are there's software, energy rating software yeah, yeah. available, which is not foolproof, of course. Mm. Um, there are... There are loopholes and there are short um there are assumptions in there that you know somehow sometimes don't um work totally seamlessly, but it's better than definitely better than nothing, a lot yeah, absolutely. better. Absolutely. Um and I would what I would recommend is that people looking to build new, a new built new home or do a substantial renovation, um consider using the energy rating as part of their design process. So what that means is that um, if you're working with a designer and you should be working with a designer or an architect who 
is across this stuff and and um, you know has the same sustainability values that you do they they you can ask them to um rate their design and then depending on the energy rating the star rating that comes out they can tweak certain things so they can tweak right. the locations of the windows the orientations the size relative to the yeah. floor size the insulation levels the materials um air tightness levels all sorts of things they can to to sort of optimize the design and that is a really fantastic tool so what lots of people do is or lots of you know professionals do is design the house and then at the very end get the energy rating done just to get the approval what i'm suggesting that that people do is use that energy rating tool as a design tool to yeah. to get to get the design to where they want it to be um and by doing that then it's it it's much easier of course to make design tweaks and changes at that stage than later on when things are you know rather more set in stone far less once they're actually built you know <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's not just about double glazing. That's a very long-winded way of saying it's not just one thing. Um, no. And most of the time, unless you have a very challenging site or you're starting with a house that's really badly designed in the first place from a from an energy efficiency thermal comfort point of view. They're out there. They are oh, definitely out there. They're definitely getting, out there. Um, the, 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 main, the first thing to consider is getting the orientation right for passive mm -hmm. solar performance. And... If you do that, then it should that should mean that getting that your design to seven stars is pretty straightforward. Um, shouldn't even cost very much more in materials or fancy systems. And I would suggest that just about all the time, um, the small extra outlay that you may have to make to in in materials, maybe extra insulation, slightly better performing windows, for example, um, will be um paid back easily by the energy bill savings that you're going to Absolutely. see from day one particularly with the way our energy prices are increasing at the moment exactly and, and i think that's about, that's making talk about that too <laughs> yeah well that's certainly making people yeah. stand up and listen now too because they're really seeing it in their back pocket yeah. i think that's such awesome advice uh anna about having uh, using it as a design tool rather than a, oh, i have to get the box ticked that's exactly. what killed me and that's what still kills me is I just want the box tick rather than using it as a tool that's going to really enhance the design of your home. And I yes. keep going back to people and saying it's not just about energy efficiency, saving money, lowering emissions. It's actually about the comfort and how your house feels. Exactly. And yes. I find it very difficult to explain to people how it feels to live in a home that's really energy efficient. I absolutely yes. love it. And I it's very hard unless you've experienced it. And I actually yes. advise people, and I've said this before on the podcast, go and um, get an Airbnb that you know is a, uh, a sustainable yes. or passive and, and go and go there for the go weekend. Stay and there. Just, yeah. Go and stay there and, and just feel what that's like. Because it's, I think that's one of the biggest beauties that I love about living in my home is just how... Uh, temperate it is all year round without any of this yep. blasting stuff going on so I love the fact that you've advised people to use the natives as a tool use it to your benefit yeah I do want to say one other point here and I know that we can go down a rabbit hole with this natives is not the be all and end all and you can have a, uh, and I know this from my own home an increased level of, of uh, energy efficiency even if you're not getting a higher star rating because there are things that you can do. Some of the passive house principles are not covered off in the Nader Star race rating. So your home can be even more energy efficient than what the star rating is giving you. So there exactly. are, as you've already alluded to, and no, there are um, holes in it. And that's because it's working. And that's off. Also, that, that, that is being um, improved all the time. The, yeah, the, which is the the Natter's research team and development team is yeah. making changes all the time, which so yeah. it, it is getting better and better. But yeah, yeah. it's um it's definitely true that some some houses, some designs, some sites fall through the cracks a bit when it comes to um being well represented, I guess, by mm. a, a Natter's rating. Um, but yeah, that's a bit rabbit holy. Let's maybe not go ready. Yeah, no, no, we won't. But, but, I, I, but another I, thing I, that I will say about it before we move on. Francis, is that sure. um, people need to be aware that the NATAS energy rating is a rating of the design of the yes. house. 
it is not a rating of the final built home. Correct. And so yes. it's really important not just to get the house designed right, but to um, get it built to the design. So it's really important not to not just to find a designer or an architect or a volume um, developer who who for who who can design a house to meet your your needs and your 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 sustainability goals, but to find a builder who will build it to those those um yes. to that design. Because if your builder takes shortcuts, then you know the the Natas rating might give you a seven point five star home based on this the level of insulation. Mm. But if the builder doesn't do the insulation properly, it's not going to perform to that level. No. So, so that's like another really, really good point. Uh, and that is where passive house is so different because it is actually accredited after the build so yeah. that you know your house is exactly as it's been designed yeah, and designed to be constructed. It's much more rigorous, but yeah. there's another rabbit hole. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> And I hope things. people, uh, maybe I'll just um, mention, I mean, Passive House with a capital P, capital H is, as you've said, a, a performance, a, a build standard that's come out of Germany originally and it's getting, mm. it's gaining a lot more ground in Australia. Yes. It, there's a lot of overlap between what we consider to be sort of standard passive solar design um, and Passive House design. Mm. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive at all. There's no need to have a fight about which one's better or anything like that. They're they're um, they're both valid, um, and there's a lot of overlap in the, in that design. Passive House takes the focus off um, north facing passive solar gain. Got, yes, I mean that's that's helpful, but not strictly necessary in Passive House, and it puts the emphasis on um, a very highly insulated and highly airtight building envelope, mm. which is a good thing to do in a non passive house as well. Um, yeah, and that's exactly and what we are, have. And there are post build tests to, yeah. um, to if you want to actually have a certified passive house, you need to do a blower door test to confirm the air tightness. Yeah. And so forth. But, and look, I have a lot of conversations with clients about this as well that you can, and we did the same. You can still design and build to a lot of passive house standards to make your home really super energy efficient without getting it accredited. Yeah. That is, yeah. You know, and that's that, what that's, a lot of people choose to do. Because yeah. especially in, in many climates in Australia, it's it's probably arguable that actually going all the way to passive to certified passive house level is not strictly necessary. It's Correct. sort of it came from a very cold climate, um, mm. and where it's obviously very effective. And yeah, so um, yeah, 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 uh, good for people to know, and yeah. and def definitely an interesting um, uh, path for people to consider. It's 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 not also not necessarily as expensive as people think it is. But it probably there is a, probably a cost premium over non-passive house. Think. So the figures that I've sort of been heard thrown around with passive, and then we'll finish off on the on yeah. the passive house <laughs> and the natives. But it's such an interesting, um, and and it is an area that people get confused about. So I think it's good that we've touched on it very briefly. Um, yeah, the figures that I've heard in terms of building to passive house standards is sort of around that 20, 30 percent more. Is that what your experience is indicating, or is it a little bit more or less than that? Oh, look, it's hard to put a figure on it, really, Francis. Um, I'd this say it's definitely rough. no more than it's that. Rough. Yeah. yeah, and probably yeah. possibly less too if you if you try. Um, yeah, it's, it's possible to build passive houses with pretty standard construction materials, mm. so, and just very careful detailing, build detailing. So it's, it's I, the I air types of, that is the critical. Yeah, I am aware it's... of passive houses that have kind of been budget passive houses. So, mm. um, I, it's not. Yeah, I would say maximum of, of that that kind of a cost. Yeah, premium. yeah. All right, let's go to uh, home size um, because I yeah. think that that is, well, it, it was a frightening statistic for me when I heard that Australia had the biggest homes in the world and I could, just could not believe that our homes, okay. as an average, are bigger than America. That just absolutely blew me away. Yep. Um, That's crazy, and it's it? absolutely, it, it's frightening. It is absolutely not something that I'm proud of. Um, and I'm also not really sure where this desire in Australia comes for ha to want to have these massive homes and then you know you sort of drive out of the capital cities and you just have these enormous homes with black roofs let's not get onto that topic and um and and yet they're all on top of each other and I just don't understand why we have this desire in Australia to have such these big homes so how 
and I'm sure you're just as equally devastated with the statistic. How can we reduce the size of homes being built? So what needs to be factored in to make this happen? And I'll let you, of course, I have a massive opinion on this. Go for it, yeah. Anna, get in there first. I know. I don't really understand it either, Francis. I mean, there's there's definitely the, the history in Australia of the Australian dream with a detached house on a quarter acre mm. block and and so forth and I and that's I think that's still the dream which is what's contributing to urban sprawl but for some reason the blocks have got smaller and the houses have got larger um it's the average size of new build house in Australia is something around about 250 square meters that's the average so that's you know half the houses built are <laughs> half bigger than that or not half that would be median but um many 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 houses are bigger than that. Um, I actually have a, a rule of thumb for sanctuary, for choosing houses for sanctuary, that my maximum is around 250 square metres, unless there's a very good reason why your house is bigger, like it's multi-generational, you run your business from home, something like that. Mm. Um, that's my unofficial rule of thumb for the maximum, <laughs> is yeah. what's the national average. Um, I am a strong proponent of building smaller. Um, I mean, sustainability has many aspects, doesn't it? It's got, we can talk about environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, social sustainability. Um, building smaller certainly supports environmental sustainability through just through needing fewer materials to build your house. Mm. So, and all the embodied energy impacts that that has by, you know, using fewer materials is less resource use, less transport, less carbon emissions to, yeah. to, um, to make them in the first place, to uh, less waste at the end of life when your house is torn down, hopefully in 100 years' time or more. Um, and also with the, you know, with the current cost of building materials, building a smaller house and using less material absolutely helps financial sustainability as well. Um, if the other benefits of, a, of building a smaller house is reduced maintenance, both yeah. cost and effort, um, reduced volume of house to heat and cool, so obviously lower energy bills just because mm -hmm. you're not heating such a vast space, reduced area to clean. <laughs> yeah. Um, I live in a relatively small house. I have one bathroom. I love only having one bathroom to clean. It's mm. great. <laughs> Um, it also it also means more garden area and it's easier to connect with the outdoors. Um, and yeah, I just want to reiterate, build smaller and you reduce the up, both the upfront cost and running cost of your house. And which yeah. can help help with financial sustainability, lifestyle flexibility. You don't have to be working quite so hard so much of the time to pay for to pay for your mm. house. So you have more time to be in it and enjoy it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and less cleaning. I think that's a big one. I get clients yeah. talk about that. Actually, I don't need such a big house. It's just collecting dust. Yeah. I think it comes down to a couple of things. Actually, to build to build a, um, you know, a, I think if we're going to build smaller as well. Actually, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll flip it the other way. I almost feel like oh, if I build a big house, then I'm going to have space for everything. And a lot of the rooms are not used, like these theatre rooms, exactly. and yeah. I'm going to have a permanent spare room. And I really challenge my clients on this. But the other thing is it means that you need a really good architect because they yeah. know how to use space in a much better way than, you know, I, I'm going to say it, than if you, you go, for example, to a volume builder. It's in their interest to build big. They're going to make more money out of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, well, oh, you'll have this and you'll have that. And it's this whole keeping up with the Joneses premise, oh, I need a big house because I've got a better status. But you do need, I think, a really good designer to be able to build a really good, you know, a, let's call it the average size home, be it two, 250 square metres. Because it means then you've got, adaptable spaces and I talk about this a lot around having multi-purpose rooms particularly when you're building what I call a forever home where those rooms need to change over time I mean my children are now going to go to high school and where are they going to study is different so we are creating different spaces within our home we've had rooms that have been um, you know so many different things over the eight years that we've been here but what I'm seeing is people are building homes that have rooms that can only be one thing 
or yeah. they're putting in so much built-in cabinetry that they lose the flexibility of what that space could be or can be over the life cycle of the time you're going to stay in that home. And yeah. I think that's really missed as well. Oh, I need a theatre room. Well, why can't you just have a, a living room that can be more than one thing? You can still watch yeah, TV. Yeah, absolutely. But Look, it's I... like it's a status thing, I think, is is what we're really missing here. I really love the philosophy of um, POD, pod design in Cairns. Um, it's a women-run practice, design practice up there, um, people-oriented design, it stands for. And they their philosophy is to build the least house possible. I love it. And what they mean by that is, um, is clever design. Well, what I interpret that they mean by that is clever, exactly what you said, clever design for multi-purpose rooms, um, minimal wasted and underused space like corridors and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, it's a yeah. key part of sustainability, really, least house possible. And the way I think that, um, the way I, I like to advise people to approach this, I'm not a designer, but I do speak to a lot of people about this stuff. Yes, you um, do. I think that, uh, and and I have had um, in, in other, in podcasts, in webinars that I have run on this topic with experts, they, their recommendations have been, rather than writing a brief that's a wish list of different rooms, um, write a values brief, you know, sit down and think about what you want living in your home to be like. Not I want four bedrooms and a home theatre and two living spaces and a butler's pantry. What do you actually want living there to be like? You know, how do you want the day to look? How do you want your family to be able to interact? What activities do you want your home to be able to support? What's important to you in terms of light, thermal comfort, connection to the outdoors, privacy from connection with others in the house, privacy from and connection with your com surrounding community. What's important? And then take that to a good good designer um, or, you know, take that with you when you're looking for a volume build, <laughs> a sympathetic volume builder to, yeah. to take on your project. Doesn't you don't, We're not only talking to people who can afford to go down the custom design route here. Correct, I agree. Um, try to, so uh, uh, take that to... When, with you when you're shopping for designs in whatever way that you're shopping um, and pick a pick a house or pick, or get a design done that that speaks to those values rather than just ticks the boxes of the this many rooms and you know oh, I love that you have <laughs> said that I absolutely love that you have said that because I talk about lifestyle what's your lifestyle like you know how do you yeah. cook how do you entertain? Yeah. rather than dictating what it is because and I think to add to that you need to then give the designer the creative license to yeah. come up with their response to those needs and those lifestyle requirements that you have for your home and really because try to avoid designing for resale value and for what um oh, what yes. some what you think other people might want I mean it's your house it's your, it'd be your biggest investment right. ever probably um I think designing for what suits you and as much as possible what will suit you in the future yes. um, is really important. And I, I absolutely agree with what you say about um, designing for room, rooms and spaces that are able to have more than one purpose now and also over time. Mm. Um, exactly. Most of the time, if you have a, a, a dedicated guest bedroom, it is not used for most Correct. of the time. Um, I, I just get really excited about houses that we profile in Sanctuary that have done this well. Um, there was one recently, a, a small renovation in Hobart that had built on a, a new kitchen, basically. it was basically a kitchen at the back, but it had enough space that it could function as a lounge room when needed because what they'd done with their lounge room was that they had um, made it able to be closed off from that new extension space with um, sliding doors to turn into a guest room because they did have interstate family who came for extended stays reasonably frequently, but not all the time, of course. So when they weren't there, that was their living room. And when they were there, they, they had just enough space in their back extension to function as a living room and that could be a guest room. And so... Love it. Or, you know, I use your guest room as a study and a sewing room as well. Um, yes. Whatever it is, is. exactly what we do. It's, multi, a, it's a study. Yeah. yeah. Monday and to Friday, it's a study and it's a guest room when people stay on the weekend. 
Yep. Um, another thing to think about is, um, having said design for yourself and not for resale value, it is still important, to, I think, to think about um, designing so that your house will be suitable for a range of future, re future residents if you choose to move on or a range of different life stages for yourself and your family. Yeah, that's... Um, accessibility is an important part of that. You never know when right, you might right. break your leg and need to, you know, even temporar temporarily or permanently need better accessibility, or you may just want to be able to invite your wheelchair-bound friend over to visit um, right. more easily. So uh, definitely um, universal design is is really what, what that's called rather than and accessibility is kind of a narrow way to think about it, but universal design covers um, things like wheelchair accessibility plus a lot mm. more. Mm. Um, our current issue of Sanctuary actually is going on sale next week and we have a universal design theme. So oh, awesome. if people would like to jump on board and um, have a look for that in their news agents from next Monday. Like then, this. Yeah, that's the current one, it's, uh, but our new one is going to be out on the 28th of November and um, that's got a universal design set theme. So grab a copy of that if you want to read all about it because uh, that really does tie in with sustainability in many interesting ways as well. Well, it does because um, it's allowing you to stay in your home longer. Exactly. And that's what yeah. I keep saying to people that um, and I, we're getting more and more uh, requests for thinking about accessibility or universal uh, design yeah. um, because I want to be able to stay here longer. I can live on the ground floor where my family come, they can be upstairs yeah. uh, and it's and, and it, and putting lifts in sometimes when there's budget for that um, yeah. so that they can, you know, come from, you know, their you know, garage or whatever it is and, and get upstairs. So yeah. it's absolute music to my, I feel like I'm talking to myself, Anna, because these <laughs> are all the things that I keep raving on about and have talked about in this podcast so many times, you know, in, in many different ways and talk to clients yeah. about all the time. And I think the other thing is people I find get really can, I should say, get um, thinking always about what other people are doing. And I have to remind them, don't worry about what they're doing up the road or what your best mate thinks about this or that. This is something that you are spending a lot of time, money and effort on and it's your home and you said it exactly like I do. It's your home. Focus on the fact it's your home, your lifestyle, how you want to live, not anyone else's. And I think by the time going on to the, you know, what, what the resale value is or, or whatever it is, people get so uptight about that. But if you're going to, if you, you're planning on staying in that home for 20 years, who cares about 20 years time? Yeah. Our lifestyles will have changed so much. The color palette will be totally different. If the design is inherently good, that's what people are going to be buying, right. inherently good design. And look, I mean, adaptive, adaptable spaces can mean a home, mean a home can be re reduced in size and still work really well. Um, and we've already been through all the environmental and sustainability yeah. benefits that smaller homes can bring. Um, as you say, Adaptable spaces means an, an ability to stay in your house and your community over time as your needs Correct. change. That now that could just be life stage, um, could be household size, could be household makeup. Um, you know, young kids, adult kids coming back, maybe with their kids in tow, elderly parents, whatever it is. Um, mobility requirements change too, as I've touched on, um, as well as just changes in how you might want to use your living space, like. For example, your Correct. need for a permanent home office might morph into a need for a space for a passion, like creating yeah. music or sewing yeah. or whatever. Um, it's giving yourself flexibility with your floor plan for the future rather exactly. than honing yeah. everything in is this is how I'm going to live now. And so oh, I'll make the assumption that that's what I'm going to need in 10 yeah. years because it won't be. You can guarantee it, particularly if you've got kids. It's going to evolve so much. And, look, this kind of thinking actually promotes um, – staging of a build or a reno or it can promote the staging yeah. of a build and doing it in stages which can be helpful for financial sustainability um you don't necessarily have to do it all at once um but doing the thinking in advance can bring bring really big benefits um i call that the master plan if yeah. you've got your master plan and then yeah, you can exactly. stage the other part you've got to know where you're going with it i think that that can yeah. make a big difference and can save money as well i was just um i was just looking at a design for a, it's not actually built yet but a design for a house um there's going to be an article on that, that in our autumn issue um it's a, a a design by elizabeth wheeler a melbourne designer who's just won a um the Design Matters National Challenge, the Home Design Challenge. Um, 
she designed a house that, among other cool things, it's a, uh, has planned for being able to sort of be separated into two, two separate apartments for, you know, multi-generational living. Awesome. And part of that is the, what, what, is, what is envisaged as the study at the moment um, could one day, it, it's, it's got, it shares a wall with the laundry and it could one day have a kitchenette put in it by tapping into the laundry plumbing. Yeah, and become exactly. the kitchenette for the yeah. for the sort of smaller apartment, and that's just genius. You know? I mean, that, that is enough. that is future proofing. To, so good. Yeah, that is such good. Yep. Yeah, future proof thinking, which I just love. I mean, it's a, it's a a term that I coin a lot because yeah. you just yeah. and that's that's a great designer really thinking ahead. That's so awesome. Absolutely. Look, I and I just want out. to say that it might seem daunting to do that kind of long term thinking when you're in this design phase, but there are designers out there who love this stuff. Mm. They they love nothing better than being asked to think laterally about future flexibility, clever use of space, multi-purpose spaces. Mm. Um, and look, I often talk to designers for Sanctuary who say, they often say that the projects with the most constraints, the most challenging ones, be that space or budget or, you know, working with an existing house to get it up to scratch, they're often the most satisfying design-wise. <laughs> Everyone loves a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they, uh, they do just produce the most delightful results quite yeah, often. That's, and they're really and you want your house and, to be delightful. And they care. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll just touch on don't a couple forget, of things. Don't forget that you about raised. designing for delight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that term. Um, the one that you were talking about in Tasmania where they could close things off with doors to make a living area a, a, away yeah. from the kitchen. It's something that I talk a lot about in terms of add doors. A lot of the designs that I see. There's no doors, there's no zoning. It means that you flick the switch and the entire 400 square metres is heated and cooled. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's you can use sliding doors and still create an illusion of space. Doors are your absolute best friend yeah. in, in terms of noise mitigation, zoning, energy efficient. They create privacy, privacy. working they from really home. really tick so many boxes, but people are reticent about, oh, no, I want this open plan thing. And I see people moving away from that as well. Yeah. When I lived in the Netherlands, um, we went to Utrecht and look, it was the Rietveld house, I think it was, and this was built in the 30s. And he had all these sliding doors everywhere so he could actually create rooms and spaces and open them up or slide them together and then create a space. And I thought that was such genius thinking yeah. way back then in terms of how to make, I think it was about 120 square metres. Mm -hmm. Uh, into you know quite a sizable space or zoning it off to and creating rooms just by joining sliding doors and things it was just like, so incredible to see yeah. um I mean, you, you, know, you do need to think about um cross ventilation and natural light yes um i mean there there are some benefits of open plan spaces from that point of view but absolutely i think uh, people are realizing that um really big open plan spaces it's hard to make them feel cozy even if Correct. even if they're at the ambient temperature is 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 comfortable, they don't somehow they don't quite feel as cozy as a you know they don't, small, they don't. Small space. And yeah, as you've said, being able to zone your space is definitely important for for heating and cooling. Um, mm. Why heat, people forget why about heat, it? Uh, why heat the half of the house that you're not using? Um, yeah. And I think the biggest thing that um, when I um, go through um, the floor plan sanity check with clients, one of the biggest things, a lot of the houses I'm looking at are double story. Yeah. And as soon as I say to them, so when you flick that switch, all that heat is going to go up the stairs Straight and heat stairs. all yeah. of this, the open plan retreat, which is my other bugbear in, on <laughs> floor plans is an open plan retreat for so many different reasons. And they're like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And I said, what about all the noise going up and down the stairs mm -hmm. from your open plan retreat with the teenagers on the Xbox and you're trying to watch a movie downstairs? You've got yeah. no way to isolate that noise. Noise mitigation, I find, and that's got nothing to do with energy efficiency, but it's how you live in the home is one of the biggest things yeah. people forget about. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's... Um, We've cut, covered a lot of things about zoning. I think for me, it's minimising the built-in furniture so spaces can be more than one thing over time and the use of doors um, for all the things that we've spoken about. So there's lots of things I think for people to consider and can't wait to get my hands on that um, episode. That Sorry, the, the edition that's coming out next week about the universal design that's going to be. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I learned a lot putting that issue together. I'll it's, learn a um, lot. Yeah. And we and, do it a lot for clients, but this yeah. it is becoming a requirement more and more. Well, 
Actually, I'll, I'll mention Thanks. that the, the new National Construction Code changes also include um, minimum um, accessibility standards. They're adopting the, uh, again, it depends a little bit on your, what your state chooses to do, but generally speaking, it's going to become mandatory for new builds to include silver level um, housing guidelines, and that's the livable housing uh, livable housing Australia silver level accessibility guidelines, which are relatively uh, not not particularly arduous. It yeah, uh, yeah. it talks about step free access to the home. Yeah. It talks about a an accessible toilet on the ground floor. Um, it talks about a certain minimum width of doorways and hallways and mm -hmm. uh, a, a few other things. So it's it's not, um, it's certainly not arduous. arduous. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, if important. you're building a forever home, like, yeah. why wouldn't you want to do these why things? Wouldn't because you do that? it just exactly. means you can stay there longer it's, and enjoy the home longer yeah. that you've created for yourself. So I think it's just a win-win on hallways. Actually, that's my other big bugbear. Uh, hallways that are, you know, two metres wide. Mm -hmm. And then I say to clients, well, okay, so that might be a big grand entrance, but this is a transitional space that you're going to have to heat or cool and you're and not going to be sitting in gonna that space. <laughs> so why do you need a hallway that's two and a half metres or two metres wide? I I really yeah. challenge it. And it's I'm a, one I, have one a, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with hallways in general. I mean, just... I don't have a obviously a sometimes sometimes they're, sometimes they're necessary. Sometimes they're necessary. Or maybe a, not exactly a love hate, but a tolerate hate relationship. Maybe <laughs> sometimes yeah, that's, they're maybe necessary, that's... but I think it's yeah, it's it's generally most of the time a good idea to minimize them. Just because absolutely, completely agree. So um, better let, let's touch on renovations because that's it. We've talked yeah. a lot about new new homes, and you know there is a big movement in Australia to knock down and rebuild. Let's not talk about that because that's <laughs> going to be another rabbit hole. There's so many rabbit holes here, Anna. But I think my feeling is, and I think, and also because of the um, the financial with, with financial situation we're in at the moment with interest rates increasing, it's certainly I've seen in the past GFC and so forth, people tend to stay and renovate, minimise, um, you know, all the tax have to pay to change homes, blah, blah, blah. They love living where they live. Yeah. Um, sometimes, though, I, I get a sense that many people feel that it's more cost effective to knock down and rebuild. Oh, the house is not exactly how I wanted and and they want a new big home. And so rather than renovating what they've got, they they knock it over and they build new. So walk our listeners through what some of the advantages are of retaining the existing home and renovating. And I suppose let's exclude the fact that interest rates are increasing. It may be cheaper to stay. Let's park the, the current economic yep. um, environment we're in. What are some of the advantages by just renovating what you've got? Yeah, look, I think we've, there's, there's, for a long time there's been received wisdom that it is, can be costly to renovate um, there are unknown. There are often, it's true that in renovations there are often unknown costs until the builders start get stuck in and then realise yeah. you know things that weren't obvious from before. Um, whereas a, a new build is kind of a, a known cost, I guess. So there's that received wisdom, but certainly in the um, there's certainly a lot of benefit to a lot of the time into to saving an existing home. Um, and renovating it, I mean, just be, <clears throat> just from the the point of view of all the embodied energy in the materials that are using yeah. that, that are in your house, uh, all those materials, however many years ago it was that the house was built, they they've already been quarried and mined and produced and and so forth and and transported and and so forth. So, effectively, by reusing those materials rather than tearing the house down, sending them to the landfill and buying new materials, you're you're getting a free ride on your embodied energy, basically, because it's it's already paid. <laughs> it's already, it's already I like been that term. You got a free yeah. ride. Yeah. On Look, your and we need to be re, we need to be reducing carbon emissions wherever we can. Um, reusing all those existing materials in a house saves a huge amount of emissions associated with creating the new ones. Mm. Not to mention the current cost of new materials. Um, which is a, a bit of a new situation the last couple of years. Yes. Um, COVID has had an impact, impact on supply chains and all kinds of other 
parts of the of the the, the world the materials supply world and so i think it's it's getting more and more attractive to keep the house you have and renovate it rather than um it's getting more cost effective <laughs> than it was perhaps to then pushing it over and starting again um also character old homes have character mm. um it's of course easy to build it's possible to build a new home with character as well of course uh and yet yeah you know, there's something to be said for for uh for, for the character of many older homes older homes are often built really well really yeah. solidly using materials maybe such as hardwood framing that either are prohibitively expensive or just unethical to source today um so that's a great great thing um beautiful hardwood floors exactly exactly brick yeah look and um some homes are uh, that all that said some homes are not worth restoring um mm -hmm. if they're very dilapidated or really unsalvageably bad um design layout um yeah and so on yeah i mean you you some homes you could spend a lot of money on and they still wouldn't be warm and cozy um but it's it's really very often possible i would say most homes out there um if they're in good condition it's very often possible with clever and often quite small rejigs of floor plan or quite small extensions um reassigning of rooms for example it's really quite mostly quite possible to make even quite badly orientated existing homes perform a lot better um some designers even specialize in this such mm -hmm. as um a couple that come to mind uh, elizabeth wheeler in melbourne who i mentioned already um mm. the design award-winning home she she specializes in low budget energy efficient renos and um so do lighthouse architecture and science in canberra another of my favorites they have uh, they're quite a big operation now but they are pivoting from really almost exclusively renos away from new builds oh, that's, to, to that's renos great. and their their focus is really on using the energy rating um uh as we were talking about at the beginning to um to focus their renovation uh, efforts on maximizing the energy efficiency and the thermal performance of mm. of the finished renovated home and they 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 do that and other designers I'm, I'm talking about them as an example but there are plenty of other designers who love doing this stuff too mm. maybe they maybe they move the, the swap the living room and the main bedroom or something like that you know open yeah. up the open up a couple of walls to increase the natural light and the airflow into the living space but um it's really impressive what a good designer can do with thermal with insulation and glazing upgrades plus a clever rejigs of the floor plan to make the put the living spaces where the so, passive, passive solar gain is best um, and, and also where people are now living because you know houses that were built in the 50s had different lifestyle requirements exactly. than what we do now but it's exactly. it is able to be flipped so that it can meet your standards or not our standards but the way we live today which is which is obviously different than what it was in the you know 40s or 50s Completely. I think the I mean, other thing is um, the ability to retrofit sustainable improvements or, you know, the thermal improvement of a home, I think has increased massively over the, the years as well, getting access to, you know, people and experts that can actually do retrofitting of, you've already said it, upgrading your windows, yep. you know, blowing insulation, getting insulation yep. under your floors to stop the drafts through your floorboards. You know, yeah. an easy one is in your ceiling. There are lots of, in your roof, I should say. There's lots of things that you can do that won't necessarily cost a fortune either. Oh, yeah, That can absolutely. do, make big impacts to your one-star. Okay, how many 50s houses out there yeah. have got a one-star energy rating? Oh, look, we've been it, talking about, yeah, I guess we've been talking about renovations as opposed to it as, an, as a choice instead of pushing over and building a new home. But if yeah. we scale right back and talk about just, um, upgrading existing houses mm. absolutely you can do a lot with a few thousand dollars um, and really dramatically improve the performance of your home and, and the, the place to start um, forget about the windows the place to start is draft proofing yeah that's what neil <laughs> always can, says draft proofing is very diy friendly it's very cheap and it makes a huge difference in older houses um gappy gappy older houses 
ceiling around your doors, around your window architraves, around your floor, uh, your um, skirting boards. If you eliminate drafts to, as best you can, that will make a big difference. And also um, another thing to prioritise is window coverings. So thick curtains with pelmets to stop the um, stop the air current going, you know. Yep. Around you've got to you've got to have the pelmet. The pelmets are important, not just it's not just a decorative feature. It actually stops air going. Um, what is it? Cold air. Or air going, going back. It, 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 it circulates into back into the space. It's circulating back into the space. Yeah, yeah. you've got to stop and that. And then air having circulate. to be and then having to be warmed exactly. again. Exactly. So thick curtains or um, honeycomb blinds. Um, if you're doing curtains, put pelmets. They make a massive difference, and they can um, they, they can. Uh, it means that you can put off upgrading your windows to double glazing for a mm. while if you, you know, because that is actually a, an expense. Um, what else? Uh, insulation. C ceiling insulation. Ceiling insulation. Is, is, what, yeah. is even more impactful than having it in the in the walls. I mean, obviously in the walls is, is going to work as well, but ceiling yeah. insulation doesn't ceiling cost then, that much. Ceiling then underfloor then walls is the order that yeah. I have been um, yeah, that's what I've been, been. Um, informed is the best yeah what order to tackle it in and um, I suppose I find that there's I suppose and you've touched on that that there's a group of okay you can you can update your house and these are the sorts of things you can do to update your house if you're going to keep it the way it is yep. but I find a lot of people are looking at upgrading because they are going to renovate as well and it's like well if I'm going to renovate I may as well do the improvements now but there's absolutely absolutely. things you can do in your current home yep. that um will make improvements but if you go, you are going to go down the renovation route and do it all at once. You, that's when you can start looking at your floor plan changes and how exactly, can you yeah. maximise yeah. your the, the passive solar and and so forth. And and um, small. If you are going to do a bigger project, even very small footprint increases can make a big difference to the functionality of your house. Um, I'm I'm thinking of a project in Canberra. Um, lighthouse architecture and science renovation of a small, they call them ex govies <laughs> um, Oh, yeah. I think ex government housing. So small, yes, that'll uh, be an ex tiny little three bedroom brick houses that there are a lot of in Canberra. This one in particular had a third bedroom that was not really usefully sized and it was in the southwest corner. Um, wasn't really big enough to be a guest room or a study very comfortably and it was dark and cold. So, what Lighthouse did was just put a tiny pop out extension of I forget how many square metres it was, you know, probably four or something square metres, maybe Not six. Not much. Not much. Popped that, that out to the west, which um, both mm -hmm. added a tiny little bit of floor space to that room and also allowed it to have a north-facing window um, past the side of the the west side of the house. And that made that, that whole room function. Uh, they put a, a loft bed kind of situation, a day bed with a loft bed above it, built-in situation as well so that suddenly made that room attractive and functional as a study as a guest room as a hangout space whereas it hadn't really been used before and mm. it was like genius it's yeah so good. genius thinking <laughs> it, there's just so many options and I think that's what I really want people to take out of today yeah. there are so many things you can do you can start small you can make a difference Yep. Um, by doing small incremental changes you can th th there's just so many things to explore now um that th than what there was there's so many resources there available to um yeah. let's talk about electric versus gas because that is yeah. really controversial at the moment yep. um sure there's is. much dis there's much discussion currently about the reliance on gas moving to electric um, you know, induction, oh, I don't like induction cooking where 80% of cooking in Europe is is, um, is is on induction. And I'm finding now too, many clients are saying to us, we're not going to connect gas to the house. And right. when I was talking to Neil about our house, I said to him, what would be one of the things you changed if we were going to build again? He said, I would not connect gas to the house. Um, we don't need it. Um, it was just what you did eight years yeah. ago oh yeah you just keep gas going look how much we've changed in eight years now it's like why do I need gas you don't need gas so right. absolutely I just agreed with you there when you said it was controversial I actually don't believe it's controversial I just think yeah it probably isn't getting controversial gas. yeah um, probably the wrong the wrong word yeah look we um we, we what need do you to... see happening in the space yeah it's not controversial it's it's, it's not controversial look, yeah um this is something that my colleagues at Renew have been um have been researching 
publishing research on pushing for a long time. We've been we've been actively pushing the get, getting off gas, going all electric um, message for several years now. It's really exciting that it um, seems to be getting a little bit more on people's radar, mainstream radar. It is. Um, it needs to happen. Gas is a fossil fuel and always will be. Um, and we certainly don't need electricity. On the other now. hand, okay. So particularly in Victoria, where I am, where we are, the grid is still embarrassingly largely brown coal powered, but mm. um, it is getting greener, and it is possible for for electricity to pro be produced in a renewable way, unlike gas. So and and also. Um, individual homeowners can already make decisions about more about making sure their electricity supply is more renewable, either by you know their own solar generation or by buying green power, various other ways. So we need to get off gas. We can't afford the emissions. We're running out of gas anyway. Um, and happily, and it's getting more expensive. Getting more expensive. It used and to it's be going to get more expensive. And it is going to get more expensive. So is electricity, but. Um, my colleagues are just putting the finishing touches right now, actually, a breaking news on some new analysis um, calling called Limiting Energy Bills by Getting Off Gas. That's what it's going to be called or something along those lines, working title. Um, in response to the, the current energy crisis, basically, the, the federal budget that just came out projected retail tariff increases of 56% for electricity and 44% for gas by 2024. I mean, that's without government intervention, which is quite likely to happen, but, you know, that's what they're projecting at the moment. Um, and so the, renew the, the analysis that my colleagues have just completed or just working on now is, is showing that annual energy bills are projected to rise for homes using gas by somewhere between $1,200 and $1,900 a year by 2024. Bill increases was uh, it, bills will still increase for all electric homes, but we're talking about increases limited to five hundred and fifty to seven hundred and forty one dollars. So already there's a financial game changer. Exactly, and look. But if you if you think I mean, about the fact, go sorry, just, Annie, yeah, just going to say, just making the point that um, yes, electricity prices are going to go up, but and so are gas. But by getting off gas and and being and moving to all electric, the the difference is that although you're that the price of the electricity that you might need to buy will go up. Um, the appliances that you'll be switching to or opting for are so much more efficient than the oh, gas right. appliances they'll be replacing that you that your costs will go down. Plus, also if you if you're not paying for gas in your house at all, you're not paying for the daily supply charge, which is yeah. something like a dollar a day. So as soon as you're or more, as soon as you're not needing gas, you're not paying that. Mm. That that cost has nothing to do with how much gas you use. It's just a fixed. No, it's just being connected. Yep. And I think so. also very proudly that Australia is one of the biggest, um, have had the biggest uptake in, you know, solar panels on roofs. Yep. Yep. You know, I mean, that is a, that's an awesome achievement. So sure why would you want to have gas connected when you've got panels on your roof, you can generate yep. your own energy to, and especially with battery prices coming down as well. Um, yeah, it just Look, not everybody sense. not everybody can have solar, of course. Um, I, of course, but but uh, it is true that it's that solar PVs are vastly cheaper than they were. Like the, the, mm. the it's really a no brainer if you if your roof is suitable for solar. Allowed, yeah, if you correct. own your roof, obviously it's uh, it's harder if you're a renter, um, or if you're in in strata, there can be barriers as well apartments and so forth but if you own your roof and you and it's suitable for solar you're not overshadowed by buildings or trees then it's really um it's really a bit of a no-brainer to it is a no-brainer solar on yeah. and if you're building a new house it's so negligible in the in terms of the whole cost of the build that yeah, I agree um you, you should definitely be doing that um so just uh I, I know there are some still some um reasons why people might be reluctant to get off gas or to 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 go down the path of not installing gas one of them as you mentioned already is people are very attached to gas cooking yes <laughs> for better or worse um but what i noticed what i have noticed in the last few years is that uh electric alternatives to 
the gas appliances that people are most attached to are, are becoming much more available, yes. much cheaper, um, much, yeah, much easier to get your hands on and really great options. Yes. And yes. especially reverse cycle air conditioners or uh, split systems, um, as a lot of people know them as, uh, just uh, I know that some people don't love that delivery of heat by hot air, moving air, you know, not uh, people, there are people out there who prefer radiant heat sources. So I get that reverse cycle is not necessarily everyone's first preference for a kind of heat, but it is so much more efficient in terms of mm. fuel use. Uh, and that's because of the heat pump technology. It's the same technology that runs your fridge, only backwards. Um, and what it does is that it uses the, the technology basically um, puts out more heat energy than is used to run the machine. So if you put in one kilowatt of electricity, um, an efficient heat pump, which is the technology behind split systems, reverse cycle air conditioners, can put out up to four kilowatts of heat energy or around there oh. anyway. So it's one to four, whereas radiant heaters are only like one to one at best. You put in one kilowatt of energy, you get one kilowatt out less yeah. often through inefficiencies. Um, and so that's why if you upgrade your home to efficient electric appliances for um, space heating and cooling and also hot water, hot water heat pumps becoming much more available, mm. your, the energy you need to heat your water and heat your house, heat and cool your house, is dramatically less. They're just way more efficient. They're very available. Reverse cycle air conditioners, of course, cool the air as well. So you don't yeah, need to have a separate the... air conditioning system. Correct. Um, look, it's a no-brainer in a new build, I think, to just opt to not not go, not connect gas. And you know, five years ago or more, um, Renew's research with, uh, was showing that from both a financial perspective and a carbon emissions perspective, everywhere in Australia, all climates, it was better to go to not connect gas for new builds. It's a little bit of a different story for existing homes that are on gas, and it does rather depend on where you are, the the, the kind of makeup of your grid electricity, the, um, and also what, how many appliances you have that are on gas. Um, mm. But even so, in most places in Australia, especially if you only had one gas appliance, it was definitely better to get to get rid of it. Um, eliminate that gas supply charge and move to electric. So, um, yeah, look, that's a, I would really be recommending people, whether they're renovating or, or whether they're building new or renovating or even not renovating, just, uh, you know. It's, um, well, it's definitely something make, you can easily changes. have a look at if it's Looking only it, your yep. stove. And, and I know that just talking to clients, they've been a little bit resident reticent to do induction it's an unknown yeah. I haven't cooked with it again I say go away to an go Airbnb try it out. I love induction. It. <laughs> you know it's not just in a yeah. in a showroom because you can't really cook your own style so yeah. go and get an Airbnb that you know has got an induction cooktop and test it out and actually that is how I discovered it and thought hmm, I actually Good. quite like this yeah because we were in an Airbnb with one uh, an Airbnb with one but it's yeah. also the technology with induction has increased massively over the yeah. last few years. And I do actually have a podcast episode and I'll stick it in the show notes where I interviewed um, Rob from ENS Trading and he went through oh, yeah. all uh, the advantages of induction and why he loves cooking with induction and all the features it has that you don't get with gas. And after having that episode with him, it's like, I've got to go and get an induction yeah. cooktop. This <laughs> is just so good. I so know. try I it out. Will- I think people assume that it's the same as old school electric. Oh, and it's so and it not. not. It's chalk and cheese. It is just a you different thing compare. altogether. No, I it's agree. It's very savvy. You can actually do more with it than you can with gas, but you just yeah. have to go and try it yourself. And Much I don't safer. think it's that hard to be a converter. No, exactly. There's an article in the in the upcoming issue of Sanctuary on induction cooktops. So basically exactly what you just said, the benef- benefits of it. And also we focused on retrofitting induction into existing kitchens and ways yeah. that you can do that. So there's three case studies in there of people who've done that in various different different ways. So, um, I mean, obviously it's easy That's to offer awesome. induction. If, yeah, if you're building a new yeah. house or even building a new kitchen, it's easy to choose induction. Yeah. But it's harder if you're retrofitting into an existing kitchen. But we've got some yeah, good ideas. It, it is. So for the new, Sanctuary for the new 61. 
get on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, there's another reason to go and buy Sanctuary Mag next Shameless week when promo. it comes out. This is being um, <laughs> recorded at the end of November. So I'm sure you'll be able to get back issues if you're listening yeah, to this, you know, in a couple issues. of years' time. Yeah. Um, exactly. but that that's a definitely an issue for people to get their hands on. Yeah. So just quickly, because I, I, I know we're um coming up for time, but I, I think this could just go for hours. <laughs> is have you got any statistics on you know the uptake for people going off grid? I suppose it's that next stage, um, not yeah. having any uh reliance on anything on grid. So have you got some stats on that? Because I find that really interesting. Look, in I don't have many- numbers. I know that, um, I mean, there is definitely interest in going off grid. I would say that unless you're rural, remote, you know, in a place where it's actually going to cost you a lot of money to connect to the grid, Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, I would say that uh, if you have an easy grid connection, it probably doesn't make financial sense really to go off grid entirely. Batteries are still pretty expensive. And if you're entirely off grid and, and without that grid backup, then you need a pretty big battery to yeah, um to well most 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 of the time unless you're you know very minimalist have a very minimalist mm. lifestyle and, and are prepared mm. to make lifestyle changes to you know manage your your consumption in that way yeah. um the size of a battery you need to to cover the you know all the peaks of demand um means it's going to be quite expensive um mm. What I what I do think is quite a good idea is to if you if you're going to have when you're installing solar and, and a battery is to um, talk to your installer about designing the system so that it's what we call grid independent. So it's not off grid; it's connected to the grid, but it it's a it's a setup such that when the if there's a power failure, your system will still operate. Yeah, that, that's a great um, yeah. in-between step, exactly. particularly yeah. if you're in a, a metro setting, you're not rural and it's not a requirement that you're off-grid just because of where you are. Yeah. Um, that's a fantastic way for people to become more self-sufficient. Yeah, and also and being connected own... to the grid does mean that your your solar generation is sort of helping the big picture in yes. a way, you know. Yeah. So it's it's like a social, social sustainability, I guess. It's... Mm. Uh, not to say that being off grid is you know antisocial or anything like that, but you know there's there's no need. I, th- I think it, it the, the grid's there and it works it works well for most of us to be connected to it and to um to put our excess solar into it, even though the feed in tariffs are negligible these days. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, to use to sort of use that as a use the electricity grid that exists as a as a a resource a social a community resource really i think there's yeah. a lot of space for microgrids and that kind of thing you know solar sharing among neighbors and so forth and that's that's an area that i i would like to see um i've seen that take off i've certainly seen that sort of it's happen very early days yeah but, it I, is, and, but you it's... know community batteries and that kind of thing so mm. so that people don't have to have individual batteries necessarily i think there's a lot of scope there and also electric vehicles. As the, as electric vehicles become more common, um, uh, technology is going to is already emerging. It's pretty early days, but um, where that where your electric vehicle can be your battery, basically your house battery. Um, oh, that's amazing. So, yeah. So that's kind of that. That, that, that's makes, that makes sense because if you're going to have an electric vehicle anyway, why would you then also have an extra battery that just sits mm. in your garage? <laughs> I'm just sitting so here that's reflecting what I'm excited on. About. You know, the last eight years, and I and I really go back to those eight years because that's when it was just I was so into what was available and not available more often at that time. Yeah. Imagine in the next eight years what's possible. Oh, um, it, yeah, absolutely. It, it's just, I mean, eight years is not really that long. And if I think about how far we've come in eight years and the change in mentality and the change in all the things that's happening and and the 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 pull demand for for change in this space rather than a push demand. Obviously, the natives is a push. A push but yeah I'm, I'm excited about what the next eight years is going to um provide for us in australia in particular yeah. and about what we can achieve so it's it's exciting what i mean i know that we've come um sort of t- to the end i've it's so enjoyed our conversation <laughs> it's just been um there's just so many amazing insights for people to take from this but if you are going to impart one piece of gold nugget advice to listeners they're thinking of renovating or building, what would it be? 
I suppose it's different for renovators or new builds, especially with what we've been talking about today. But what's your gold nugget for people to go away with today? I've actually got four. Is that all right? Oh, you can have four. You can have four. Go. So number one, find a designer and or a builder who's passionate and knowledgeable in this area. And there's plenty out there now. There are plenty out there. Yeah, there's plenty out there now. Um, number two is use energy ratings early in the piece as a design tool. Number three is spend your money on things that improve the energy efficiency and thermal comfort and are hard to retrofit later. Yeah, so in, okay. which by which I mean instead of spending money on fancy tapware and, and fancy bench tops that look lovely but don't contribute to the energy efficiency of your home, it's spend it on in, insulation, <laughs> which you're never going to see, but it's going to make a big difference. Oh, I say this to people all the time. <laughs> the stuff you put it in if the If you build. have to choose between yeah. spending money on this or this. Yeah. Yeah, and the fourth thing that is, all the time. The fourth gold nugget is go all electric. Yeah, they are awesome tips. I think if people just went away with those four, they'll be in the show notes as well. They are really, really good tips. And um, yeah, we didn't touch on the whole um, thing about if you had to choose. Uh, and even as a designer, I did it in my own home. I can replace the tiles relatively easy yeah. compared to replacing my windows. Exactly. So we put the yep. most, the best windows in that we could afford because yep. all that other stuff I can change. Yep. So I just let it all go to say the build that we've got to put the money into the structure of the building exactly. before the building anything envelope. else. That that the, the building envelope. That's right. So where can people find out more about creating a more energy efficient and sustainable home? You got heaps well, of resources here, I think. I do. Sanctuary Magazine. Yes. And, Renew, and our sister publication, Renew Magazine, which is a little bit more focused on sustainable technologies for homes. Yes. They're both consumer-focused magazines. Um, when we set up Sanctuary in 2005, I wasn't there, but I, I was there not long after, um, it was with the aim of um, kind of making ma um, sustainable homes mainstream and um, letting people know that they didn't have to live in a mud brick home and be barefoot with dreadlocks to have a sustainable home. Um, so that's our mission is to is to um, show how it can be done in so many different ways and to um, arm people, arm our readers with the knowledge that they need to to do do it themselves as well. Uh, there's a lot of concrete practical information in in both those magazines. They're both published. Well, I think you've nailed it with Sanctuary because it's a beautiful magazine to look at. Renew is, as you've said, a lot more technical. It's not, you know, focusing on, you know, beautiful homes and things like that, but there's so much knowledge and information yeah. in there. And um, we're impartial. That's the other thing. We're independent. Yeah, so, which is great. Yeah, but I think Sanctuary really nails it. It's beautiful to look at, but there's a lot of practical advice. I mean, I flick through it and find new supplies in there that I can contact um, yeah, it's that's what really we try and do. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, the amount of um, editions, um, the amount of magazines you sell next next month on edition sixty one <laughs> is going to be higher after this podcast. It's going to so be too. an awesome issue. Shameless plug. So um, another place to look is the um, is what's called your home. Yes, which is a fantastic resource. It's basically a sustainable home design manual. It's published by the Australian government. It's um, just a couple of years ago, put out its sixth edition, so it's it's constantly updated. It's available. It's about, it's the book's about, about two thing. inches yep. thick. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big book. You, you can either buy the print version or it's actually all the information is available for free online. So it's a fantastic resource. It's very user-friendly. It's very beginner-friendly. Um, a lot of the uh, authors, the expert authors, also write for Sanctuary. Um, they're in our networks. So look, that's that's the first place I would say, tell people to go. Actually, go and read your home, um, get a grounding, subscribe to Sanctuary and or Renew um, for more inspiration. Uh, Sustainable House Day is an event that our publisher Renew runs every year, and uh, it used to be an open homes day, single day. Obviously, since uh, since COVID and lockdowns, we've pivoted it to be more of an online event, which has just meant that we've been able to expand the reach hugely. Mm. It's now um, a day of online events, plus there are some open homes events happening around the country this time around as well. Um, it's also, there's a whole lot of satellite events, expert sessions, panel sessions, Q&As, that kind of thing. 
lots going on. It's actually, it's, it's happening in March next year, 2023, the 19th of March, but the program has already kicked off. Um, I ran a series of, of webinars on Sustainable Design 101 last month. Awesome. They're all available on our Renew YouTube channel. If, you, if people want to go and re-watch those, that was a really enjoyable um, series of events. And there's, there's more events happening before the end of this year and then around March, April next year, there'll be mm. a whole lot more. So it's what uh, to cut to the chase, Sustainable House Day is a peer-to-peer -peer sharing opportunity. Um, so people who have already been down this path of creating a sustainable house or they're in the process, they open their homes virtually or in reality, whichever, um, and share what they've learned and share their mm decision-making processes and the results and so forth. And it is just a terrific way for people considering doing this to hear from people who've already done it, hear from the architects and builders in some cases as well, ask their questions, check out the results, have a look at what the materials chosen look like. Mm. Um, it's really great. It's it's a, it is a beautiful uh, community. Free. It's a beautiful community day. Um, I opened house my house twice uh, pre-COVID. Uh, that was when Sustainable House Day was still quite new. The way you've yeah. expanded the program has just been incredible. And, yes, I think COVID enabled you to, to pivot and do the virtual tours and then also the webinars. Um, but we had, you know, tours go through. Neil went through how we actually created the house, some of the, the things that we would do differently. I did it from yeah. an interiors perspective. Um, and it was beautiful. And we had so many people, you know, so grateful and, you know, asking lots of questions and interested, you know, how the natural pool works. And it was just beautiful to have yeah. people come in and for us to be able to share. And I'm that was, like I said to you um, when we were chatting before, that it was to, to knock that notion on the head that you had to live in a house made out of spare tyres like <laughs> Kevin McLeod. Yeah. You can, um, but you don't have to. Promote, well, you can, but it doesn't have to be like that because that, you yeah. would never know by looking at our house that, it, that it's a very uh, sustainable house that's airtight and everything else. So I highly suggest and recommend Sustainable yeah. House Day. And I just can't believe how big it's got. It's amazing. And I, so, I just love it when I, um, when I am interviewing a homeowner for a house profile of their beautiful sustainable house to go into sanctuary and they say oh yes you know the process started for us when we came to sustainable house day four years ago yeah, <laughs> so, yeah i've had a lot of contact mission, with people that mission have come, accomplished <laughs> yeah that have come to our house they've re-engaged it's it's been beautiful so yeah. that's a great that great resort so many free resources yeah, absolutely. and partial absolutely. free resources yeah. so there's so free much and almost there. free yeah and uh, and the, the last one that i'll just mention quickly is um my Efficient Electric Home, which is a Facebook oh, yes. group. Yes. So not actually affiliated with Renew, um, but it's a terrific group. It's grown hugely since the beginning of COVID. It's yeah, a part it's, of you know, it's a volunteer administered group of people who are passionate about um, helping each other to make to to make their homes more efficient or mm. their new whether it's new builds or existing homes, whatever, um, more efficient and um, gas free so you yeah, know I'm, I'm actually part of that great group. it's a great people are so generous in what they share so I think yeah. if people have questions there are so many um, groups and uh, resources that are available and people are really willing to share because I think people that are doing this are quite passionate yeah. so they do love other people being interested in it so I just oh, think one, there's been sorry, one, well, I just thought of one final 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 one um, renew our publisher not-for-profit um, environmental organization we actually have branches around Australia so if you'd like to be in touch with people local to you who are doing work in this space um, they're volunteer branches they run events they um, they show up at home shows they they you know run seminars and learning opportunities and so forth um, jump onto our web website renew.org.au and search for your local branch and get along to it is fantastic people can do yeah. And we'll have all those links in the show notes um, for all the resources that you've talked about, um, including Sanctuary Magazine. So <laughs> I, we certainly encourage you to check that out, particularly um, issue 61. I think today's just been fantastic. I've had so, I've really enjoyed talking to you today, Anna. It's just been so wonderful to speak to someone that's 
I, 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 like I said, I feel like I'm talking to myself, just yeah. passionate about all the different things that I just, I feel like a broken record sometimes when I talk to my clients about it, because it's just these, sometimes it's just small things that can make such a big difference. And I think today's episode gives people so many opportunities to look at some of the little things or big right. things that they can do to make such a big difference. And you know, it, it, it's so much more accessible now. So I Absolutely. thank you so yeah, much. I guess just the final thing that I I want to say is that it's really not that hard. No. You know, you don't have to create the most sustainable house possible. You can no. create a really lovely sustainable house that goes somewhere along that path to being, you know, the absolute ultimate without it being expensive and without it being difficult, um, just mm. through being aware knowing what you want and making yeah. choices that align with with those goals so go for it and plenty i think of, there's plenty been of help out there exactly and i think there's been heaps of tips and ways that you can do that in this episode and so i thank you so much for your time today anna it's um no worries. it's just been an absolute Lovely pleasure to, to, to chat you. to you today okay thanks francis bye bye Thank you so much for listening to this episode of My Forever Home. If you're ready to renovate or build a new home and you need help to create a beautiful and functional forever home, you can book a chat with me directly at whitepebbleinteriors.com.au backslash chat. Have a great day.